So we are we are so happy to uh, welcome back again uh, Pete Fleischman. He he spoke um, at the Advocacy Project Lecture quite quite a number of years ago. Um, so Pete has a huge amount of experience of, of working in in this field. Over twenty seven years of experience working in advocacy, um, user involvement, participation, co production, and um, including fifteen years at Sky Social Care Institute for Excellence, which I'm sure. You're, you're all um, aware of. And then since then, Pete has, has taken things forward and founded Co-Production Works, which supports organisations to work in co-production with people who use services and, and with carers. Um, Pete's worked um, with a huge number of people and a real diverse range of people who, um, who, who are using services. So just um, people such as groups such as uh, mental health users and survivors, care leavers, people with learning disabilities, refugees, asylum seekers, disabled people, older people, and also people with head injuries and um, pain clinic service users. So huge, huge amount of experience. Um, and, and we're talking about co-production today, and this is something that um, we at the Advocacy Project feel, feel really passionate about. So the focus today is on getting co-production right. So, so really, really important um, to getting it right so it's meaningful and it's not, um, it's meaningful for, for all our organisations and importantly for, for those people who are, who are taking part. So I will um, stop talking now. I will hand over to Pete. And as I say, there'll be plenty of time for um, questions at the end. Um, you can raise your hand at, or if you want to put um, something in the comments, that's that's also fine. So Pete, over to you. OK, thank you. Thank you for such a, a nice int introduction. It's it's really great to be here. Um, a real um, a real privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, I think um, advocacy and other activities that are about increasing the system voice in our in our public services are so important um particularly at this time when there's there's so much pressure on public services and the cost of living and and so on and you know people are are, are really struggling and and um you know services are under such 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 huge pressure i i know um from my own personal experience of using mental health services in my sort of teens and and twenties, um, how important it is to to have your voice listened to, and I I mean really in 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 my experience, which was way back in the eighties, nineties um, sort of thing, um, uh, you know there was no there was no advocacy, and I think my um the, the the way that I was treated in the system might have been quite different if I'd have had an advocate. I mean, I had um, electric shock treatment when I was twenty. You know, I I I had it voluntarily, but still, you know, if I think if I'd have had an advocate, somebody in my corner to sort of like argue my case, uh, perhaps perhaps that things things would have been different. Although it is um. I still wouldn't have got uh, automatically got the right to a statutory um, imha. Still, I think I would have uh, sort of like escaped the the, the net of that. Um, and um, I was only just speaking to a friend of mine um, who's an academic um, in, in a uh, in a, at King's College University, and he he was also using services. And um, he was telling me about um, how an advocate really really helped him out. Um, when he was being sort of over medicated and the medication that he was getting was really not 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 working for him and an advocate really really kind of sort of turned you know it was a life-changing experience that there was some somebody there for, for him at that at that point and really um really changed things for him so um as Ali said I um work for uh the Social Care Institute for Excellence um and I've now set up co-production works, which offers training, consultancy, and support around co-production to public service organizations. Um, and we also um, do away days and sort of reflective practice and that sort of thing as well. So I'm gonna talk to you today about co-production, about good practice in co-production. It's kind of an, uh, quite a broad overview of co-production. Um, 
But first, I'm going to show you a film, The Blobs and the Squares, which is a nice kind of introduction to co-production. I so hopefully not too many of you have, have seen it before because it's um, quite well known now. But um, it bears quite a few viewings, I think. It's just six minutes and it sort of explains co-production in a humorous way. And it's talking about co-production um, with sort of the government, with, with, with sort of um, government services, but I think it's it's relevant to all to all services. So um, I'll share my screen in a second, and then um, after that, I'm going to talk for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll hopefully we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. The parable of the blobs and squares. Governments like to do stuff. They think they can help and make people better. They're also answerable to the people, and they don't want to be seen to waste their money. And they take this responsibility very seriously. Uh, so seriously, in fact, that they count stuff and measure stuff and arrange stuff, so they can tell people where their money has been spent. It's really not that easy, and so they have to order the stuff in certain ways. But some things can't be countered, measured, and arranged. Let's call these things the problems. Sometimes the problems don't look like squares. Sometimes the problems involve people. And when problems and people come together, they aren't squarish. They are, well, blobbish. Blobs change and don't like being stacked and arranged and organized. Why, government wondered, did every time they tried to solve a problem, did the problem get worse? Why don't these problems know what's good for them and stay put so that we can fix them? Mm, the government said, this isn't working. We don't seem to be able to get to the bottom of this. Who can we get to help us understand the problems better? <coughs> But because the government is so responsible for how they spend people's money, they needed to find people they were sure they could trust to spend it wisely. They asked some people like them, who look like them, and talk like them. And they gave the money to them, because they trusted them to manage it, account for it, and spend it in a sensible way. And of course, they looked, well, a, a bit uh, squarish. This is a big job, said the little squares. We must do our best to succeed. And so they set about developing the tools to do the job, the equipment, the institutional capacity, professional expertise. And they set about understanding the blobs better, because how could they help if they didn't understand the problem? They invested in the process for solving problems, and they invested in the infrastructure for solving problems. But no matter how much the squares try to reach out into the community and understand the root causes of the problems, they never managed it. They really weren't able to get to where the problems were. They were, well, just too uh, squarish. Oh dear, the government squares said to the little squares, this isn't working. And it wasn't. A gulf still separated the squares from the blobs. It wasn't working because however well they understood the problems, the problems simply weren't theirs. And no matter how hard they tried, the problems just wouldn't stand still. We've invested all this money, said the government, created all this expertise, built all this resource, but it still hasn't worked. And so they tried to bridge the gulf by asking the little squares to find blobs they could partner with. And so the little squares invited the blobs that seemed like they had the energy, vitality and the drive to make a difference to work with them and sit on their boards as representatives. This time they didn't just experiment on the blobs, they asked the blobs what they wanted and what they thought and how life should be. But this approach made the blob unhappy because it seemed to reinforce the difference even more. Oh dear, the squares said, this still isn't working. So they tried giving some of the money directly to grassroots organizations that were very blobby. They must be able to solve the problem, they thought, because you can't get closer to the problem than that. But to be trusted with the money, the blobs had to produce reports attend training sessions and write risk assessments. And by the time the blobs had done all this, something strange happened. They had ceased to be blobs and had become little squares. And by the blobs becoming squarish, they lost everything that made them blobs. Their energy, 
grassroots connections, vitality, and something more important happened. They became neither blobs nor squares. They lost their sense of what made them who they are, and they lost their sense that they could do something to help, that they could solve problems, and that they had an idea of how to make the world a better place. We think there is a different way. We think the squares are really good at some things, and we think the blobs are really good at others. We think co-production is a different way for squares and blobs to work together. While the squares <coughs> may well be the experts in the process, the blobs have something equally important and something the solution needs, the context. Co-production is a partnership where the process and context have equal value, where squares and blobs need and value each other for who they are and what they can give. One is not more important or valuable than the other. It isn't about imposing a solution on the problem. Instead, it is about understanding that the solution can only lie in the problem. It is only through a process where the assets of both the squares and blobs are valued equally that great things can happen. Each one of us has a strength. As a professional is more than their job title, a person more is money. more than their problem. Co-production matters! Great, so hope hope that was entertaining as well as informative. So I'm going to open my slides uh, and just talk for 15 or 20 minutes just about co-production. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about three factors that formed co-production. Um, I'm going to give a definition and some principles. Um, talk a little bit about what can be produced, talk about the ladder of co-production and the jigsaw model of co-production, and then just finish off with some practical tips. So um, I think there's three factors that shaped co-production as we find it um, in the UK today. And um, I think it's it's useful to have this sort of historical sort of context to it, to be able to understand it. Um, so the first sort of factor is academic and think tank work. So the word co-production was actually coined by an academic um, working in Chicago um, in the 1970s called Eleanor Ostrom. And she was doing some work on um, the Chicago police. And what she found was that when the police reduced foot patrols and started um, working from their cars more, crime went up. And so one of her conclusions from this was that the community need the police, but also the police need the community. And so she suggested that there should be more equal partnerships between the police and the community. And she called this co-production. And um, her ideas were really expanded by um, somebody called Edgar Kahn, who was a former uh, speech writer for um, one of the Kennedys and uh, a, a civil rights lawyer. Uh, and he formed a, a relationship with an English think tank, the um, New Economics Foundation. And the New Economics Foundation really sort of imported the sort of Edgar Kahn brand of co-production uh, to England in about, I think, 2000. And that was very much about sort of something called time banking, which is a way of sharing time equally. But that really introduced co-production in, 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 into the UK. But then I think... A really important factor that's shaped co-production in the UK are social movements and communities. So ever since the 1990, uh, the sort of 1990s, well, even maybe further back than that, the sort of like the, the 60s, people who share a particular identity or a particular issue or, or use a service um, uh, or have a particular condition have started sort of getting together to help one another and to support each other, but also to sort of engage with the public services that they use and to try to, in, in, to, try to improve them. And so we find like across um, public services, um, all sorts of people, like older people, people with um, learning disabilities, people with physical disabilities, people, mental health service users, um, 
LGBT people, um, all sorts of different groups coming to, coming together. And there's a great deal of sort of experience and knowledge within those groups um, ab about the issues that they face, but also about how to engage um, from a uh, from a position of strength with um, institutions and, and organizations and I think that's really shaped co-production some of those people might not and groups might not call it what they do co-production but I think it's nevertheless is is co-production it's really important and some accounts of co-production don't include uh, social movements user groups and so on and I think but I think that's that's it's really important that they're uh, included and then the third thing is policy and practice so um, I think um, probably dating back to the sort of 90, I think it was 1990 Community Care Act, um, all the sorts of legis kinds of legislation that have affected uh, public policy around health and social care have included some nod or acknowledgement that um, this sort of like involving citizens has a role to play in improving outcomes. And that's been true across you know, different, different, you know, whatever party's been in power, whatever administration's been in power, they've always sort of tended towards that, that sort of position. Um, and uh, I think in the, in the, um, in the Social Care Act, I think co-production was first referred to and defined, um, but in all sorts of bits of legislation, um, it, 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 there's, there's more sort of, citizen involvement the importance of citizen involvement is highlighted um unfortunately that has also come at the same time as a sort of squeeze on services so although possibly people have a little bit more say in services um there's less sort of service to to go around and less resource to go around so before i talk about a bit more about what co uh co-production is i wanted to say a couple of things about what it's not so i think consultation and co-production are very different activities so a consultation is where and, and I'm not saying that consultation is a bad thing it's a sort of important thing and lots of organizations um, for instance local authorities have to do statutory consultations when they change things but I think consultation is different from co-production in that usually a consultation is um, is where an organization or an institution has kind of decided uh what they want to do and um they've they just want to see what the public say you know they 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 might be able to tweak things a little bit but they've decided the general direction of travel um but they want some views and they might change a few things around the the the, the out sort of lying things but um whereas co-production is a much more sort of thoroughgoing activity where in its purest sense, it's really going to a community and sort of saying, what are your, what's your life like? What would help? You know, how can how can we work together to solve some problems? Um, and there's much more ownership of um, the activity. So that's that's a real big difference. You could, in uh, during co-production, a co-production program of work, you might do a consultation, but a co-produced consultation would be very different from an ordinary consultation because you know that whatever surveys or questions or events you did would be co-produced so they'd be organized you know in an equal partnership with people who use services and communities so secondly i think partnership and co-production are quite different again partnership is really important it's really important that for instance the local authority and the sort of like foundation trust work work together um, other organizations working together but i'd call that partnership or collaboration not co-production because the magic ingredient in co-production is when citizens people who are direct recipients of a service get involved and if if it's merely two organizations working together i don't think that's co-production and as co-production becomes sort of kind of more main, mainstream and well um known there's a bit of a danger of the term being diluted and you know pe people in a local forest say, oh yeah we co-produced with, with with you know with um another organization that's not really co-production at all so there's lots of different definitions of co-production it can be quite confusing um i've recently st started using this definition which is from nhs england um because i think it's got quite a lot of authority um and it's it's quite a reasonable Def definition um and 
So NHS England say it's a way of working that involves people who use health and care services, carers and communities in equal partnerships and which engages groups of people at the earliest stages of service design, development and evaluation. So I think it's a good definition, really, talking about getting people involved early, talking about groups of people and talking about the different kinds of activities that they can get involved in. But it might be actually, I think it's possibly easier to think of co-production as a set of principles. And again, there are a lot of different principles around. Um, when I was at the Social Care Institute for Excellence, we developed four principles. We co-produced them. Um, we also looked at the research. So I think they're quite a kind of credible set of principles. I like them possibly because I was involved in, 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 in producing them. So we've got four. So the first one is equality. So it's about forming equal partnerships. It's about acknowledging that everybody has assets. Everybody's important, should have an equal voice. Um, but it's it's also thinking about sharing power and how power is distributed. So one of the things about equality is acknowledging that there might be um, differences in power between people who work for an organization and people who are using services. Not always, but usually um, the staff will have more power, more authority than the people using services. And if uh, one way of thinking about co-production is that it's a process of kind of trying to reduce that power differential and trying to make it as, as a level of playing field as, as we can. So secondly, um, accessibility, very, very important principle of co-production. Um, for some people, if we haven't thought carefully about their access requirements, they simply can't participate. Um, and this can be a, around a lot of different things. It could be environmental things, uh, it could be flat access, dis, dis, disabled toilets and so on. But it could be what time you hold meetings, um, the formats of meetings, the language that we use, all sorts of things to, to make sure that people can fully participate. Then um, another important principle of co-production is diversity. Really important that we've got the right people in the room, that nobody is excluded, that we're reaching out um, proactively to seldom heard groups, and that nobody's excluded from co-production uh, co activities for reasons of um, having protected characteristics such um, as race, gender, um, sexuality, age, disability, and so on. So that's it's really, really um, central to co-production, I think. And then finally, a bit of a jargon word, reciprocity, took me quite some time to be able to pronounce it properly. But it simply means if you put something in, you get something out. So it's thinking about how do we reward and recognize citizens for getting involved in our activities, giving their time. That could be through um, uh you know food and 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 drink it it could be through um access to training and and expanding networks uh it could be some form of time banking or time credits um but if somebody if a group of people are involved in a sort of sustained piece of work that's going um along over over a sustained period of time and there's a real requirement then it's really important to think about um how, maybe paying people so that that and that is a real element of equality so I think co-production at first can can feel a little bit um, uncomfortable. And a, a, a good friend of mine, a, um, a disabled man, said, if you're not some, um, do, if you don't feel uncomfortable, you're, maybe you're not doing it properly. So when, particularly when you first start doing co-production, it's it's worth just trusting the process, tolerating a bit of uncertainty, thinking that this uncomfortable feeling is just part of working in a different way and introducing a, a new group of people into in, in uh, into decision making. So all sorts of organ uh, activities can be co-produced. Um, so the sort of like the way services are designed, how services are delivered, uh, research can be co-produced, how services are monitored and evaluated can be co-produced. Uh, Co-production in terms of the governance and strategy of an organisation, getting people who who um, use services and carers onto boards and so on. And I, I noticed that um, the advocacy project has has some some people on their on their board. Um, uh, communications, I think, is a big is a big opportunity. Sort of how how do you disseminate your messaging? How do you you know um, how do you engage with the media? 
that should um you know if you've, if you if you've got people who use services communicating your messages that can be really really powerful and then finally um co-production can influence um and be be involved in guidance and developing policy so if you google co-production or co-production ladders you'll um, probably come up with a ladder a bit like this um, I think it's quite a useful tool for understanding co-production and kind of auditing as an organization or as a project or, or uh, where where you are in terms of co-production so it it starts at the bottom um, talking about co coercion and educating which is um, trying to sort of fix people um, who are passive recipients of service and then it goes through consultation engagement and at the top there's co-design and um, co-production and I think uh, on the sort of right hand of this, this the the um, diagram the sort of doing to doing for doing with is really is a really useful way of, of thinking about um, practice in an, or, an organization and sort of working out where you are um often organizations will be doing a little bit of all of them and um obviously doing doing two um sometimes that's you know that's necessary we wouldn't want to um i don't know co-produce um an emergency call or, or 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 open heart surgery so um even though it's at the bottom of the ladder in certain circumstances still important the thing about the ladder is it doesn't really help um a project or a program or an organization really go up the ladder it, it, it sort of like lets you know where you are um and so this um co-production model uh which the social care institute for excellence designed um developed thinks about an organization um as ha as ha being a, like a jigsaw um so there's organizational culture how the organization is led what values the organization has organizational structures so the sort of policies procedures governance um the rules and regulations of the organization organizational practice which is what does the organization actually do especially when it comes into contact with um, members of the public or clients and then organizational review how does the organization monitor and evaluate its activity and learn and so if you want to increase co-production move to a more co-productive way of working then change needs to happen in all of the parts of the jigsaw and so i think that's a, that's a really it's a really useful way of thinking about what what needs to happen in an organization so i think finally just wanted to talk um just a little bit about the practicalities of co-production um i think co-production is oh just got something on my screen sorry um co-production all right i'll stop i'll stop sharing um so uh but just to finish off, I think co-production is really about group work. It's it's really about working in, uh, together in groups and forming groups. So for most co-production activity, um, you need to form a steering group and you need to think about um, who's going to be on that steering group, how are you going to run the steering group, um, how are you going to make sure that everybody can participate equally in, the st in, in, in a steering group. And um, it's thinking sensitively about um checking out are you working towards the principles I think the principles are a really handy sort of checklist just to sort of check back where you are um uh and also just thinking about um what people need to participate so if you're setting up a, a meeting with members of the public it's been it's thinking about how, that they're different from people who work in organizations um in lots of different ways and it might not be sufficient to sort of send an email around and, and send a team's invite and expect people to turn up you know it's got to be a bit more proactive than that it's got to be more thought about access um you might want to um have a chat with everybody before the meeting you know so that you sort of like get to know everybody individually a little bit before the group that that seems to really be helpful so there's lots of kind of practical things and also planning is really important co-production does take a little bit more time um, and capacity particularly to get it going but you can mitigate that a bit by 
really think sort of planning out a sequence of meetings for for example and and just thinking about that so there are, i guess there are a few sort of tips um about how to do co-production but that's um all my slides um and my talk so i hope that was interesting i hope it wasn't i, I hope i sort of pitched it at the right level for for the audience um and i'm happy to take questions Great. Thank you so much, Pete. That was really, um, really interesting. And I, I love that video of the 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 blobs and the squares that really has um, really tells it how it is, doesn't it? It has it has it has enormous um, impact. So so thank you so much. Um, I don't think I've seen a question on chat. Is there um, if anyone wants to raise their hand if they've got a, a question for Pete? Can they see anything there? Oh, anchor. Yeah. I think someone did ask if we were going to have slides of a presentation, um, which was brilliant. Thank you ever so much. That's kind of like, you know, really, really good presentation and short and sweet to the point. Um, yeah, as um, I think some some people might not be able to join us today. Yeah, OK, that's fine. We can we can um, share the slides. And um, Pete, one of the things that um, I think in in our work that that we do come across is the overuse of the term co-production you know um organizations sort of um you know saying that they they want co-production and then when you come to sort of do the work it 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 maybe sits a little bit lower on on that ladder is that something that that you see quite a lot of um Sometimes I think, you know, co-production is quite patchy and it's quite a sort of fluid term. I, I think um, definitely you, you do hear organisations, you know, as I was talking in my talk about, you know, where working, what they mean is they're working in partnership with another organisation. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think one of the thing that it's sort of like there is a sort of um, flip side to that as well, where um people feel co-production sets such a high standard so they're sort of kind of a bit intimidated and don't know where to start and um that's one of the sort of i think issues with the concept is that it sort of like sits there at the top of the ladder and sort of seems a bit inaccessible and that puts people off kind of just having a go and maybe not doing it perfectly the first time because it is a sort of iterative kind of process i think mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess, I guess it, it, for, for some people that might, it, it could feel a little bit intimidating. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Ian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I mean, on a similar theme, I guess it's, it's what are some of the um, challenges in trying to set up co-production? I mean, how, how do you, in terms of trying to get people to become involved, What's the um, you know what what are some of the tips and hints that you know might work for our organisation? Uh huh. And are you talking from the the advocacy project? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I I'm sort of quite a fan of kind of gradual change and thinking you know thinking about sustained sort of change and starting starting slowly. I mean, I think. Um, from what I can understand from the advocacy project, there's qu quite a lot of like, you know, you would share very sort of common values around co-production and sort yeah. of a lot of activities that you do probably could be termed co-production. You've already got some people on 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 the board. I mean, I think it's um, you know, sometimes I think organisations um haven't pulled together everything, haven't thought about it in a strategic way. Um, but I think it depends what stage the organization is. If you haven't done anything at all um, and it's totally new, it's probably best to sort of like start small, pilot something, you know, try to just get a group of people, I don't know, that, that, that are using a particular service, get them together, start talking to them, say, you know, we want to learn from you. We would like, to, you know, how could we improve things for you um and take it take it from there it's about building a relationship it is i mean it is hard to i mean finding the right people can be an issue um but once you found one person um 
then it gets a lot easier. I mean, I remember some work I did with um, uh, in the criminal justice system, people who, who had mental health issues and were in, involved in the criminal justice system. And I um, uh, was working for an organisation trying to set up what we called in those days user involvement. But it was a real struggle until I met this guy and um, one of their clients. And um, he just got it. And um, as soon as I sort of built this relationship and a sort of partnership with him and then when we were going around talking to other groups of um people he just had so much more credibility than, than me mm -hmm. because i you know i didn't share exactly that experience um and he, he you know and then it sort of mushroomed from there but i did spend a lot of time waiting in cafes to meet people and they didn't turn up and stuff like that <laughs> sort of, i'm sure that a lot of you have had that <laughs> experience um mm. And I think um, also not everybody, you know, people might want to be involved, but if you said, as you said, you know, accessibility is one of the, the key factors and, and um, people might want to be involved differently. Not everybody likes to be in a room with a group of other a group of other people, but, but has got, you know, a huge amount to offer to a, you know, a, a co-production opportunity. Abs absolutely. I mean, you need lots of different people. You do need lead people, you know, who will occupy kind of leadership inverted commas positions but yeah that's definitely not for for everybody and some people might just want to so you need to you, you know to like they might want to be involved occasionally um or they might want to produce a blog or mm. you know lots of so you need to offer lots of different ways mm. For people um, I know there's involved. a couple of hands up, but there's a there's a question, um, a couple of things come in on the comments. So um, one question was, can you say a little more about real life examples of excellent um, co-production and what makes the difference between really effective co-production and other times when it's more sort of superficial or, or lip service? OK, um, just thinking of um, a project that I was involved in which was in um the london borough of lambeth working with um people with learning disabilities and uh we worked with two organizations that were run for and by this is when i was at the social care institute for excellence we uh, that were run for and by people with learning difficulties um one local and one national uh and it was a real it was a real equal partnership we i mean the thing was that um the Social Care Institute for Excellence, we, we ran a competition for our sort of network um, and they had to come up with proposals of projects that they wanted to do. And then we offered the sort of our support and the support of a bid writer. And so they these two organisations sort of won that opportunity. So they were involved right from the beginning. It was kind of their concept. It was like what they wanted to do, not something that we were imposing on them. And then they were involved from the very beginning um and also the two groups um were very empowered groups so they had you know some people were learning difficulties with quite a lot of experience of doing this kind of thing but they also had a reach into the community as well um and so the project ran a a, a sort of new sort of holistic way of supporting people in the community um with learning disabilities and it it worked very it got lottery funding and it worked very very effectively during covid actually to sort of provide really practical support um and it sort of as well as providing kind of advocacy um and social participation support and i think it was just a really a very equal partnership um and then we produced there's a lot a lot of materials on the sky website um that is uh, and you can just see from those materials how accessible they are. They're, they're just completely accessible. There's lots of films. It's all in easy read. It's just that project has a different it has a different feel, and you you can just feel the co-production in that in that project. So I think that was a good example of co-production. Thank you. Um, and there's another question here in the, in the in the chat. Um, so with a lack of resources and capacity in grassroots organizations, do you think what statutory organization, sorry, statutory organizations are trying to do co-production that will work? Have I read that outright? Does the 
I think I get... <laughs> got, got a bit tongue tied there. Does the person who asked the question want to just, if, if I haven't got that right, just clarify? It is me. Hi. It's Hi, me, yeah. uh, Just to explain what I said. I think within, uh, because I work with the BME Holds Forum, and we're trying to uh, facilitate or try to link the grassroots organization with some statutory organization like the council, local authority or the NHS. But when we're trying to kind of recruit or just try to link, there is no capacity at all in the grassroots organization. Like they don't have the time, they don't have the staff to come and talk to the people to do co-production. I just find like because of the lack of the resources, most of the organization, because they're quite small, maybe they got one staff member, even the accessibility, we're talking about the values of accessibility, equality. I don't think this kind of value is there to do that like a partnership and co-production because just there is no resources and capacity within this sort I know there is a kind of interest and willingness from the such organization to do that, but within the current situation, with lack of resources, lack of capacity within this small organization, they're doing fantastic work, but just they don't have the resources to come and talk and, and contribute services. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I think that's a common, that that's, that's a really common issue. And I think, um, I mean, sometimes there can be an expert. I think statutory organisations, well, they're also under pressure as well. So it's a very complicated situation. But I think the sort of good, bigger organisations should be thinking about how how can they support um, that organisation? How can they increase the capacity to get involved if they really want um, mm. that that community group to get involved? But I think it's, I don't have the solution for you know austerity you know 12 years of austerity really and, and that's what we're all there we're we're, we're struggling with but i think um you know co-production can really reap you know it, it, it's it's worth pursuing because it, it can really be life-changing for the people that get involved and improve services for everybody um yeah really important it is it is a challenge isn't it with with resources and particularly those like like you say those really small organizations that maybe just have i think you said one member one member of staff it's it it does it does take resources it does take time to do co-production you know to do co-production yeah. properly and that that is one, one of the challenges that we mm -hmm. that we have absolutely. isn't it absolutely thank you yeah thank you <laughs> um a couple of questions in chat but i think paul you've had your hand up for a while Thanks, Ali. Thanks very much, Pete, for a very interesting talk. Um, very quickly, two, two questions. So I have worked with an advocacy organization in the past, and we had a tender come up. And so we thought one way to um, give ourselves a good chance was to do a little bit of co-production in the hope that we could show that the service that we intend to provide is what service users want or wanted. And I wonder, is that, can, would you call that co-production? Um, because it was done at the time when, when we were trying to get something out of it. And very quickly, a second part to my question is, um, is it possible to do good co-production um, in secure settings like a psychiatric hospital? Thank you. Uh, two very good questions. I mean, the first one maybe is more straightforward. I definitely think co-production, well, the, the process you're talking about, I think would be really good practice because I think often um, it, it is a real problem with sort of, you know, like the big lottery once, you know, it's got, I think, good good policies around you know what it, it wants uh projects that are shaped bids that are shaped by citizens um but it doesn't provide the money or the resources to actually you know put that bid together with the community so if you if you're able to do that then yeah i think that's a really good starting place because then you're not kind of uh going back to the community and sort of saying oh we've got this money you know we'd love you to get involved but maybe it's not something that they want, you know, necessarily, you know, so I think that's, um, then I think, I mean, co-production around people sort of, I don't know, sort of like hardcore mental health services for it, you know, 
it's it becomes much more difficult i mean i think co-production in um even in acute services in mental health it's a different relationship because there's a legal you know there's a legal requirement and people haven't got less and less rights um they really and and also people may be in crisis as well so i think that's that's quite complicated maybe people need advocacy in at that point more than co-production but on the other hand i think um there would be lots of opportunity you know i mean wards of all kinds would be better if they were if if they were if they were co-produced i mean there's something that's used a lot in the health service called experience-based co-design and it's quite a kind of uh well-developed sort of manualized process of of getting um sort of what they call patients um not a term i use necessarily but patients and staff sort of a group of patients uh who use a particular ward for example they talk about their priorities for improving conditions on the ward and then somebody works with the staff they they uh develop their priorities and then the two groups come together and come up with a group a, a sort of shared understanding of what could be improved i don't know if that that some sort of process like that might work quite well in the nhs because it's a sort of like you know they like the sort of formula and the sort of tried and tested sort of kind of approach um but you know i mean there's a long tradition of patients councils and that sort of thing in 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 mm -hmm. in, in mental in mental health that have been quite effective but it it's persuading the powers that be at the moment that that's you know that something it's it's something that they would like to do worth doing i think um, Mm. thank you I, I think um like you say pete you know it, it, it's sort of patchy but certainly we've seen some you know really good co-production and been involved with some good co-production in in hospital settings um o o over the years with with you know some really sort of very um you know some, some really interesting and quite practical sort of outcomes for patients which is really in, in um you know improve their experience of, of of being in the hospital so certainly um you know that is an area of work that we've you know that we, we we've been involved in certainly um an area where co-production can can really have an impact um i'm just going to move on to a question from the, the the comments here um pete so um sure bit more of a toughie I think this one but anyway <laughs> do you think there should be a legal requirement for co-production so for example in the NHS social care etc and should there be basic standard guidelines for co-production yeah that is a tricky that's a, yeah. that, I looked I saw that in the chat and I thought Natasha, that's, you can thank Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tricky it's it's um it's a trick it's a tricky question I mean I I probably I, I mean, I probably would say yes, um, mm. but it's sort of like when you um, when you have a legal requirement, for one thing, it doesn't actually always ensure that that always happens. Um, and I think, you know, with um, the one that I know about is independent mental health advocacy. And I, I we did some work at Sky, some guidance. But the reason that we did the guidance was um, because we were aware of some research that said you know i think it was like 50 percent of people who should have the right to an imha are not getting an imha and then there's all sorts of sort of things around race and gender and stuff like you know that's sort of like they're even even less likely to get an imha so even though there's a statutory right to an advocate doesn't mean that you're going to get an advocate and i'm sure you're more aware of that than i the, 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 than i have so that's kind of like legal requirements don't necessarily guarantee um that something will actually happen there's got to be sort of cult you know culture change there's got to be capacity um there's got to be leadership and so on um but i don't know i mean advocate and, and then it, i mean advocacy has come you know when I, I i mean i helped set up an advocacy project in brenton harrow you know i think it was 1990 five maybe something like that and i mean advocacy was so different was much more grassroots there was no mandatory requirements and so on and sort of advocacy has really really changed and i think you know the the the, the mandatory requirements has expanded advocacy so i suppose mandatory requirements for co-production would expand co-production but then it might 
as it becomes more mainstream it's made, made dilute it it's sort of like you know it's 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 com it's a complex question but i think i'd probably lean on the side of yes there should be a, re a legal requirement and i think all services should be co-produced and it should be just the natural way that we do things and that that's a gradual kind of um trajectory in terms of you know i don't know it wasn't you know 150 years ago people didn't have the vote you know women there wasn't then there wasn't women's suffrage and sort of like so and it's a gradual if you take a positive view of history it's you know gradually citizens are getting more and more rights and sort of the right to co-produce and the right to have an advocate should be part of that so it's sort of human rights i think um Yeah, great. Thank you. I guess, you know, we, we what we want to see is as much commitment to co-production as possible and having it as a as a legal requirement. Um, you know, it you you would hope that that would that would mean that there there's a you know, people would do it. But as you say, in, in reality, that isn't that doesn't always follow exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> like that. I think sadly, we're a long way off that. Yeah, um, at the moment, yeah. anyway, I think. But, Certainly, yeah. it's talked about a lot more than it used to be, isn't it? I mean, you know, I think, I think it, it's 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 something that we hear about a lot more that that organisations want to see, but there's still a lot of challenges around um, making it making it happen. And and um, as has already been commented on, you know, the um, resources is a big is a big factor, and and that's a challenge that we're facing, you know, across all the work that we do, isn't it? Um, you know resources um i think we just got there's time for just just one more question here in the chat um um pete which is what are your views of experts by experience this links up with paul moore's question um should more services use expert by experience for co-production yeah i mean i think de de definitely i mean i think i mean i've <clears throat> i mean i come from the sort of user survivor movement in mental health and sort of like you know it was at one you know it was a sort of separate it has a separatist tendency and it's sort of getting the views from the horse's mouth I think so I'm very much you know support organizations that are sort of of people rather than for people and those are the real those are the real views that you want and I think um and I think you know people who are using services experts by experience i'm not sure i mean i'm not sure if that includes family members and carers um but i think family members and carers and actual sort of service users have kind of different perspectives both are important so i think yes experts by experience at, at, you know at, at, absolutely um but I think co-production is depending on the kind of service. It's also about getting community organisations in, in, involved who represent those groups who have grassroots. But in the end, I think the, the magic ingredient for co-production is people, who, you know, people who use services and their fam and their families. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm just checking. Um, have I missed anyone's? Oh, hang on, a new message. Um, have I missed anyone's questions that might have come in on comments? If anyone wants to shout out, no. Okay, so I think I've covered all of that. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Pete. That's been really interesting. I could listen and talk about co-production, um, you know, for for so much longer. It's such an important um, important um, part of of our work um, and making sure. Um, you know that 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 services and decisions are made with, um, you know, and and not just for for people. Um, and it's as I said, it's something that that we we really feel passionate about at the advocacy project. So thank you so much for um, speaking with us today, and thank you to everybody who has attended and um, for your for your questions and and insight. That's that's been really. Um, really useful. So um, we're finishing a couple of minutes early, which I feel quite proud about. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so thank you to everyone. And um, I think that um, Cleo just put some information up about the next lecture. Um, let me just see. I think I saw something. 
Cleo, do you want to shout out? Because I can't see it now. I, yeah, so the next lecture will be about modern slavery um, towards the start of January. So details will be circulated in the next week or two. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, as um, Cleo put on, on the chat, we'll send the slides out. And obviously, big thank you again for Pete for your, for your time um, this morning. That's been really, really, really interesting. Thank you. It's a real Have pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.